Hi everyone, I'm Raphael from uh, Energize Me Fitness and also uh, Living Energy Pilates and Rehabilitation. I'm an exercise physiologist and I'm an expert on improving bone density with exercise. So today I just wanted to talk to you about um, some exercises and movements not to do if you have osteoporosis. But before we get into that, I wanted to mention um, my exercise and lifestyle program, which we call the Bone Density Booster Program. Uh, it's designed with the latest medical research into bone metabolism, and it can help you stop or even reverse the loss of um, bone density from osteoporosis. But uh, we'll leave um, details of that in the description of the video. And uh, any, any post we do, we'll leave the details of that so you can find out more. Now, um, firstly, if you don't know much about osteoporosis, then I, told you, I would suggest you look at my other videos on the topic. I've produced two videos so far. Uh, the first one was a, a bit of a background on osteoporosis. It tells you about the risk factors and the strategies that you can put into action uh, when you've been, when you have it to help uh, mitigate the, uh, the problems with osteoporosis. And the other video was uh, about the three best exercises to do to perform to improve your bone density. So check them out after this uh, video if you haven't already. And again, we'll put a link in the description. We'll put some details in there for you. Now, <clears throat> the most important thing you should do if you do have low bone density is stay active. This is because exercise has an osteogenic effect. In other words, it helps your bones become stronger and more dense. So exercise has the potential to reverse the bone loss of osteoporosis. But, and this is the important but, if you have osteoporosis, then your bones are more brittle and weak than the average person's. And the danger with low bone density is that certain activities can, can put too much pressure on your bones and cause them to spontaneously fracture. And this is in fact how most people unfortunately find out they do have osteoporosis. So often there's no outward signs or symptoms. It's just, you know, they have a fall, something happens, they have an impact of some sort and something breaks. Um, and fractures due to osteoporosis are very serious. Fractures can lead to chronic pain, they can lead to disability, loss of independence, and even a, a premature death. In fact, 12 months after a hip fracture, you have a 15 to 37% chance of dying. So there's really nothing much more, um, can be worse than that really. So osteoporotic fractures, they can occur pretty much in any of our 206 bones in the body. But the most common sites of fracture uh, in people with osteoporosis occur in our weight-bearing bones. So in the spine, in the hips, in the pelvis. Uh, in people with severe osteoporosis, uh, spinal fracture can be caused by you know, a simple movement such as um, lifting a light object, sneezing, um, or even just bending forward. In people with less severe osteoporosis, then obviously a bit more force is required to, um, to cause a fracture. So something more like a fall or lifting a heavy object. Now vertebral fractures um, in osteoporosis, they actually occur twice as often as any other type of fracture. Um, and they're often called wedge fractures or compression fractures. I've got a, um, I do happen to have a picture I prepared earlier. So as you can see here, that's uh, somebody's spine. You can see the back of the spine here. You can see the front of the spine here. If you imagine that these bones are a little more hollow than the normal person's. And so when that person bends forward, they're compressing the front, the front part of their um, spine. And as a result of that pressure, the bone can just crumble. And when it crumbles, uh, you can see that it collapses on one side and forms this sort of wedge shape 
whereas the normal ones are more square. Um, and the problem also is that 80% of compression fractures, um, people just feel like, they may not feel like a, it's not like fracturing your arm or your leg. They might just mistake that sort of pain for, you know, some sort of arthritis or muscular pain. And so 80% of these type of compression fractures actually don't get picked up uh, and, are, and are never treated until, you know, subsequent fractures happen, something more serious happens. And um, often this can result in a bit of a cascade effect where you end up with multiple compression fractures happening along the spine. Then you end up with loss of height uh, and you, you end up getting stooped over, which causes other health problems as well down the track. So anyway, this brings us to uh, rule number one, which is do not flex the spine forward, especially under loaded conditions. So exercises that are commonly given to people like sit-ups or toe touches, um, they're a no-no. Basically uh, lifting heavy items from the floor with a rounded back, again, you need to avoid that. And even activities like lawn bowls, which you think are pretty gentle, um, can actually cause a fracture as well because there's the bending down, there's a small weight in the hand as well. Um, something else to keep in mind is, is weeding the garden. People often fracture um, their spine or their vertebra when they're just doing simple things like that. So basically we need to modify our chores and activities so that we're not bending the spine forward quite as much. Um, we need to modify our chores so that you know, maybe we're picking things up at a waist height rather than off the floor, or we're putting things down at a waist height instead of putting them down on the floor. Um, I know even my mum who has osteoporosis, um, when she used to play lawn bowls, she was told not to, not to bend all the way down to the ground. She actually had to release the ball from halfway up. So you can continue doing your activities, but sometimes they do need modification. Um, Weeding, as I said, weeding, try not to bend forward and, and weed the garden, but maybe get down on all fours so your spine is in more of a neutral position. Um, something else I should mention is maybe yoga and Pilates. Yoga and Pilates um, have many health benefits, particularly strengthening, uh, improving your balance to reduce the risk of faults. Um, but there are also many forward bending poses in yoga and Pilates. So make sure that your instructor understands osteoporosis, understands uh, the risks involved, and understands how your own um, personal history and also how to modify the exercises safely for you. So there's no reason you need to give up necessarily your activities, but uh, you will need to modify them. Now this brings us to another point, which is excessive twisting. So like the forward bending, which causes those compression fractures in your spine, excessive twisting can also cause compression fractures. So rule number two is to avoid excessive twisting. Um, and this is where activities um, such as golf and tennis, we can put them under the spotlight because in severe cases of osteoporosis, again, you might need to actually curtail those activities or just stop them altogether. But in less severe osteopenia, for example, where um, they're probably safer for you, then you know you can just modify your golf swing so that, for example, you're turning your hips more rather than just relying on a spine rotation. Or in tennis, for example, that you're using your feet better, so doing performing better footwork to turn your body more rather than just twisting and trying to hit the ball. Um, something else to keep in mind is, is the force of the rotation. So if you're playing golf, for example, and you're trying to knock the, the skin off the ball uh, when you're driving, then obviously that's a lot higher velocity, a lot higher, for, a lot higher force is involved in that sort of rotation than um, if you're just putting, for example. So 
you might need to modify your swing in some ways to either reduce the amount of force or as I said use your body differently uh, and the same with tennis now <clears throat> Um, the most dangerous of all osteoporotic fractures are actually hip fractures due to the uh, risk of morbidity, which I mentioned earlier, and the serious complications that often go along with this. And even if you, let's say you're one of the lucky ones, you don't die in the first 12 months after your fracture, um, or you wouldn't be watching this video if you were, uh, let's say you do recover, then often people who have a hip fracture unfortunately don't recover fully. They may not regain their full quality of life that they had before. Uh, they may be left with some chronic pain, some ongoing pain. They may be left with some disability or loss of independence. So hip fractures are really something you, you do want to avoid if you can. Um, and usually they do occur as a result of an impact or a fall. However, in people with really weakened uh, bones from uh, you know, more severe osteoporosis, then a relatively minor impact such as you know, bumping their hip on a piece of furniture can actually be enough to, to fracture a hip. So now I've got a, a picture I prepared earlier. So if you can have a look here. Uh, as you can see, there's someone's pelvis, uh, the spine running up that way. We've got the femur or the leg bone down here. And you can see the ball and socket there. Uh, we've got a good view of that, yeah. So unfortunately what happens, um, there's a structural weak point here, right at the neck of the femur. You can see how it becomes narrower here from the main part of the femur becomes narrower to the ball. So often if people have a fall, they'll fracture that neck of the femur or they'll fracture uh, trochanter here or further down on the femur itself. They're all nasty, all right? You don't want to, you, you certainly don't want to fracture your leg. So, um, so things like uh, anything with a high risk of falls, this is our rule number three, avoid activities with a high risk of falls. So ice skating, hopefully you're not ice skating in your later years, but you may be, who knows? I mean, you might be lucky enough to be able to do that. Uh, roller skating, I've fallen over pretty much every time I've roller skated, but some people are good at it. Skiing as well. Walking in high heels, maybe if you might be going to uh, a formal occasion, so you decide to put on those high heels, maybe think twice about that because a lot of people fall over. Even younger people with better balance and uh, and stronger bones can fall over and really fracture something. And often, if it's not a hip or it's not an ankle, it'll be the wrist or forearm. When somebody falls and tries to land and catch themselves, they'll just shatter that, the wrist or the forearm. Um, and again, that can happen with even someone with normal bone density, but someone with osteoporosis, they're going to require less force uh, or less impact to end up with a fracture there. Alright, and this brings us to rule number four as well, which is avoid high impact exercises, not just falling over, but actual exercises that create um, impact through the bones. So normally we encourage this sort of thing for people with low bone density, in that weight bearing uh, activities help strengthen and slow the loss of bone density. Um, however, if you're if you have severe osteoporosis, then just going for a jog or a run, or I don't know, jumping down off uh, a high step, can be enough to cause a fracture. So you need to be a little more careful with your activity. So. Um, something as high impact as running can lead to a fracture with someone with more severe osteoporosis. So again, not saying you necessarily need to stop, but you certainly need to modify what you're doing. Something like power walking or walking briskly, um, while maybe for some people might be an option uh, to help maintain their high level of cardio, um, but reduce the impact or reduce the risk of a fracture if you have severe osteoporosis.
Now, jumping activities also fall into that category. Something like jumping rope or jumping jacks, uh, anything that involves abrupt or explosive loading into your bones or impacting of feet is uh, something you might need to avoid. Now, these are four general rules. I'm, I'm speaking very generally because I don't know your specific uh, situation or your, your health history. Um, and you can apply those rules, but they do need to apply, um, you know, with a bit of knowledge of your own health history, with your own, uh, with your own body, what activities you've done in the past. Um, you know, someone, for example, who has what we call a minimal trauma fracture. So someone, for example, who was bending forward and, and had a compression fracture or sneezed and, and, and broke something, um, they're the sort of people you have to be or have to be very conservative with or very careful with in terms of loading and impact. But someone who maybe has played tennis all their life or been very active, has been a runner, um, you know, maybe lifted weights, that sort of thing, uh, then they can be, you can be a little bit more aggressive in terms of loading. So <clears throat> really there's no one size fits all. There's four good rules to follow, um, but there's no one size fits all prescription for exercise. Um, you really need to apply, apply it based on your own health history and your own personal experience and the knowledge of where your spine's at in terms of the severity of osteoporosis. So, um, if you don't know exactly how severe your bone loss is, then that's where you'd need to speak to your GP and, and really get a referral for a, a scan, a DEXA scan, to, to get a, a quantitative measurement of um, the quality of your bone. Uh, and that way you know how much or where, you, where, you're, where you're coming from and how much uh, loading can be placed on your bones. And then after that, once you've got that scan and you know those sorts of details, then you know really it's up to speaking to your exercise physiologist, someone like myself or whoever you might be seeing and making sure they uh, have that information and that they're across osteoporosis as a disease and also um, they understand how they need to modify exercise to suit your yourself. All right, well, thank you everyone. Uh, that's it from me today. Hope you got something out of the session and uh, we'll see you next time.